when the Buddha taught breath meditation to Rahula. He started out with some preliminary meditations. Reflections or perceptions to keep in mind as you get the mind in shape to be with the breath. And these reflections and perceptions can be useful in all kinds of situations. One of the perceptions he taught to Rahula was make your mind like space. Nothing can be written on space. This is an image that keeps reappearing throughout the canon. And the Buddha is talking about developing goodwill for people who have spoken harshly or lied to you. He said, make your mind like space. Make your metta, make your goodwill like space. Space, he says, doesn't have a surface. Nothing can be written on it. In other words, some people abuse you. You don't take it and keep it. You don't keep a record. You're trying to make your mind have that spacious quality where nothing can be written on it. There's another passage where Mogollon is being tempted by some women. And he says, there's nothing here that can be tempted. He was an arahant at that point. And again, he said his mind was like space. Nobody can write anything on it. So this is a quality of mind that you want to develop from the very beginning. And you can take it all the way through. It's useful to think about this. We're going to be having a large group of people coming in a couple of days, and even though they're going to be quiet. Still, the fact that there are lots of people, there are lots of opinions. And even when people are quiet, they can send all kinds of messages. And just the fact that their schedule is going to be different from ours can create some problems. So try to create as few problems as possible for yourself by making your mind the kind of mind that nobody can write anything on. Keep that perception of space. That whatever they do, it's like writing on space. There's nothing there to write on. And so you don't keep anything. Our problem is that we tend to be like people who are engraving things in stone. Something happens we don't like, and it gets engraved in the mind as if it's never going to be washed away. Of course, that becomes a burden. The stone itself is a burden, and the engraving is a, bur a burden. So it's good to learn how to put those things down, let them go, have that mind-like space. It's larger than anything that anybody can do. Keep that quality in mind, and you find that whatever happens in the course of the next few days, it just gets spaced out, you might say. There's space all around it. It moves through space and then goes away. That way there's no residue left. This ability to let go of things without residue, it's an important part of the practice. You're sitting or meditating. If you're going to get any kind of concentration, you have to be able to let go of anything that comes up. Not make a little mark and say, I want to go back to that later. Just let it go, let it go. The Buddha made a statement one time when he'd given up the, his wish to continue living. And Ananda found out, Ananda pleaded with him, said, please reconsider. And the Buddha said, once he'd given something up, he gave it up for good. There's no way that, that a Tagata, he said, could go back and pick up something or take up something again that he'd let go. It was because of that that he was able to find true happiness, because that third noble truth is letting go, letting go without any strings attached, without any nostalgia for the things you let go. And so there's a quality, again, that we want to develop from the very beginning. With generosity, when you give something, you let it go. This is one of John Fung's major pet peeves when people would come and give things to him and then insist that he had to do this or do that with him. He said when they give it, if they didn't really give it, then it's not really a gift. You have to give it and give it up, and that's it. Now, if the person who receives what you received, what you gave, doesn't do what you like with it, you're always free not to give something again in the future, but what you've given should be given. 
Otherwise, the tendency to hang on, to hold on, just keeps going deeper and deeper. It gets harder because there are lots of things that are harder to give up than just things. So from the very beginning, we should have the attitude that once you've given something up, you give it up for good. John Fearn taught me this lesson one time when I was making a robe or dyeing a robe for him. A group of us had gotten together. We decided he needed a good robe. So someone bought the cloth. We arranged for an old monk, an old Chinese monk who had been a tailor before he retired and became a monk, to do the sewing. And then it was up to me to dye it. And John Fung said he wanted it dyed the old way. He wouldn't tell me what the old way was. I had to find out. No chemical dyes. It was all just the gankanun, the heartwood of the jackfruit fruit tree. And it required a lot of boiling and boiling and boiling of the jackfruit tree to get the concentrated essence. It was about two weeks. Dyed the robe, looked really nice. And John Fung wore it once and then gave it away to a monk I didn't like. That was a good lesson. Let go. We've got to develop this quality of mind because otherwise we hang on to little things and little things pile up and pile up. And it's hard to find your way out. So whatever comes up in the mind, if it's not part of the path, if it's opposed to the path, you've got to see, see it as something that's worth just sloughing off. And that way the path gets lighter. You get lighter as you walk on the path. And you can go through the world without things being written on your mind. This contemplation of space is it's a useful perception to keep in mind. And if I told you the story of Yum Tam, she was an old woman who was a student of one of, one of John Fung's students and came to meditation late in life. And one night she was meditating, and a voice came to her, she was meditating, and says, you're going to die tonight. So she figured, well, I might as well meditate. If I'm going to die, med die meditating. And so she sat there, and she had, sat there had the feeling like the body was like a house on fire. She tried to focus here and couldn't stay there. She focused there and couldn't stay there. There was no place in the body at all where she could find any comfortable focus. And then she said she thought of space, the space around the body, the space permeating through the, through the body. So she focused totally on the perception of space and let go of every other perception concerning the body. Stayed there for quite a while. And then she realized she hadn't died. She came back in the body and all returned to normal. And she said she learned a good lesson that night. When there's no place you can stay in the body, there's always space. So even though you haven't reached the level of the infinitude of space in your meditation, still it's a useful perception to hold in mind when you need it. After all, it's one that the Buddha taught to Rahula from the very beginning. Even before Rahula started doing breath meditation. Make your mind like space. Make that the context in which everything else is happening in the body, in the mind, in the social world around you. Think of it all happening in space. It makes things a lot lighter. This perception of space is not the it's not the goal, but it's a useful perception to master as you work toward the goal. It helps take a lot of heavy issues and makes them a lot lighter.